And we're back. At time of writing, Devil May Cry 5 is not out quite yet. It's soon, but not quite here. However, everything we've seen so far from the previews to the demo to Hideaki Itsuno's beautiful smile leads me to believe that it's going to be great. As a matter of fact, let's turn to Future Ryan and see what they think of the game. Thanks, Future Ryan. That's basically what I guessed. So far, everything is shaping up to give us the sequel that we wanted, and that is just goddamn peachy. However, this does require us to ask what this means for all of the games in the franchise that came before it. Devil May Cry 1 has long since been accepted as being kind of poorly aged, which is wrong, but also a discussion for another day. DMC 2 is... DMC 3 is already generally accepted as lacking ever so slightly on a mechanical level, but more than makes up for it with its storytelling and enemy design. I heard someone made some videos about that once. And then there's Devil May Cry 4. Since day one, DMC 4's primary claim to fame has been its absurdly rich combat mechanics that allowed for an unrivaled degree of self-expression. The culture of combo videos that has spawned is second to none in any single-player video game out there, and for damn good reason. However, with the release of DMC 5, it appears as though that crown may very well be snatched away. Yes, there is the ongoing hashtag inertia controversy and the current lack of a turbo mode that certainly leaves room for debate and discussion as to which truly has the better combat, but it still feels like a relatively safe bet that its throne won't remain its own for long. At least not exclusively. In the long run, I think the best case scenario for DMC4 here is that it becomes the Super Smash Bros. Melee to DMC5's ultimate. Two things that are each deeply rich and rewarding in their own way, but where one is not inherently any better than the other once you take in the game as a whole. And without that crown, what does Devil May Cry 4 have left to make it stand out from the rest of the series, and indeed, action games at large? Well, let's talk about that. Here's a question. If I were to edit The Shining from here... I'm sorry to differ with you, sir. But you are the caretaker. To immediately cut to here. I'm coming! You can't get away! Would the movie still be a masterpiece? The natural impulse is to say no, because it would remove over a third of the movie and really screw with the pacing while leaving out some very precious context. However, cutting it here means we would still have this. And this. A little slow tonight, isn't it? <laughs> and th no, 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 absolutely not. It wouldn't be as perfect as it was, but wouldn't all of these shots still remain as powerful and potentially iconic as ever? And by proxy, wouldn't that mean that the movie would still be perfect within its individual parts, even if the whole is transparently incomplete? There is a popular conception that art requires a certain level of polish and, more importantly, completeness before being considered masterpieces. They need to be fully realized, complete in as many ways as they can be, but what about the things that are as perfect as they can be in one way, while utterly lacking in another? Is flawed masterpiece an oxymoron? Let's keep this question in mind as we begin to examine... Come on! Devil May Cry 4 is a deeply flawed game, without question. Even its most die-hard fans will openly admit to that on the spot. The generally accepted theory is that the game's development time was cut woefully short, down from three years to two, smack in the middle of the game's creation. Whether or not this is true is known only to the good people over at Capcom, but this would go a long way to explaining the game we got. DMC4 is a work that is transparently compromised in a wide variety of ways, but most notably in the latter half. Or rather, its lack thereof. All 11 of the initial Nero missions are incredibly well assembled. You move quickly from place to place with unique and interesting settings and gimmicks appearing near constantly. And then you hit Dante's levels and, uh, turn around. 
You want to know how much unique content Dante gets in his levels? Exactly one room and the savior. The former of which makes a cameo in an early Nero level, and the latter of which is... This is the first thing most players notice, even on their initial playthrough. But this is really only the beginning of the game's faults, especially once you step back and look at the bigger picture. Once you really start to pay attention, all of the cut corners start to become very obvious. There are only 16 base enemies and 9 bosses in Devil May Cry 4. And two of those bosses are the Savior, which we've already established sucks. <laughs> and the containment room, which is so bad that I'm guessing the argument in the comments won't be about whether or not it's good, but whether or not it even counts as a boss despite having one of these. How this thing got past the planning phase is beyond me. Contrast this to the 24 enemies and 15 bosses of just the original release of DMC3, and yes, I am counting each Virgil fight as its own unique boss, because they are don't at me. Someone could attempt to make the case that DMC4 tries to go with quality over quantity. After all, not every enemy in DMC3 was perfect. But given that chimeras exist, I don't know if I personally buy into that. Rather, it just feels like there was more plan that simply didn't make it in. Might also explain why there are so many recycled DMC1 enemies. I want to believe these enemies are just here as a loving nod to the series' roots, but given how desperately starved this game seems to be for every shred of content it does have, kinda doubt it. Likewise, the writing feels somewhat lacking in several areas. Despite Nero ostensibly being this game's main character, we never really find out what his deal is. Where'd he get his arm? How'd he wind up in Fortuna? Why does he not have any parents despite pretty clearly being a teenager? Who knows? Sure, we can and did make a lot of Virgil-shaped guesses about those things, but this game just does not give us many details on our star player. And Kyrie. Oh dear god, Kyrie, they did you so dirty. I sincerely struggle to think of a more archetypal and cliché damsel in distress character put into a game this successful from last generation. From start to finish, her entire purpose in the story is to be saved by Nero. This is not an exaggeration. Kyrie appears in 12 scenes in Devil May Cry 4. Guess how many of those don't involve her being saved by Nero in some capacity? Just guess. Two. Once in the opening scene where she's singing, and then again after Mission 1 where she gives Nero the Red Queen. Once you're done with Mission 1 though, she becomes a human prop for the rest of the game. And look, I'm not going to get into the, uh, political side of this because I already did that, but it does unquestionably turn her into the most boring, flat, and uninspired character in the whole franchise. Which for a series defined by its awesome character writing is, as Plato would say, a massive bummer. The Devil Bringer gets more character development than Kyrie. Both of these factors, the poor pacing of original content and the underwriting of the new main characters, comes together to create a game with a story that's generally pretty serviceable, but also feels kind of pieced together with whatever they had lying around. Quick side note, you may notice I didn't list the dice game here among the negatives. That's because the dice moves in a set pattern and you can get exactly the roll you want by timing it right and hitting it with the Devil Bringer when the number you want is on top. And once you figure that out, it makes for some interesting strategic choices should you chase an S rank, meaning it was actually a skill-based mechanic this whole time. Does it still kinda suck? Yep. But point is, all of those bullshit rolls were actually your fault. Hell is real. Welcome to it. Now, for the uninitiated, you may find yourself asking, if all of that is true, then in what universe could anyone ever consider DMC4 to be a masterpiece? And you see, there's a simple answer to that. While I don't want to oversell it, the core combat mechanics and gameplay engine of Devil May Cry 4 is, to put it delicately, Satisfied. You are set free. 
To this day, there has not been another action game to even really come close to rivaling DMC4 in the depth of expressive systems it has to offer. Like, there's technically Bayonetta and the other array of releases from Platinum Games, but without getting into it too much, those generally serve a slightly different niche of action games. There is really nothing else in the world quite like Devil May Cry 4. Not even DMC3, or for that matter, DMC5. If you're looking for a rich mechanical sandbox of action game tools that allows for a degree of self-expression on the level of performance art, this is, without question, your best call. It's a unique combination of factors that makes DMC Force Combat the monolith that it is. First and foremost is, without question, the moveset of Dante. Don't get me wrong, Nero's toolkit is absolutely stellar. Most action games would be freaking blessed to have a character with even half as much depth as him as their star. Same with the characters introduced in the special edition, especially Virgil. Especially Virgil. But Dante is a completely different beast. His moveset is made up of, and this is true, I counted, 79 completely separate moves, abilities, and combos. Many of these moves can be easily chained into each other. This is especially true in the air as the ability Enemy Step allows you to interrupt literally any animation by jumping off of an enemy you're currently touching. Here's the catch though. That jump has no cooldown animation, so you can immediately begin a new animation as soon as frame 1. This is the fabled jump cancel, and on its own it would be enough to give the game a disgusting amount of depth, but this is actually just the start of it. Thing is, despite the game's incredibly rushed development, or indeed maybe because of it, more on that later, there's a couple, let's call them quirks of the engine that affect every character. Things that may or may not have been intentionally designed that can and do affect gameplay, and that the game can't really stop you from doing. Things like reversals that allow you to change the trajectory of directional moves like Stinger and Caliber, which allows for quick repositioning to open up a ton of combo path options for top level players, and quick getaway options for players who might not have fully mastered everything yet. My personal favorite of these is Distortion. This is a bug? Mechanic? Bug officially canonized into a mechanic? Thing. Distortion is a thing that happens when you activate Devil Trigger within a very tight frame window when one of your attacks connects with an enemy. Doing this successfully means the attack will actually hit twice. This makes it pretty powerful in any context, but especially so with the most powerful moves in Dante's arsenal. Most notably, this works with the move Real Impact, which already does an embarrassing amount of damage even when used normally. When this move is distorted, however, its damage output goes from, oh wow, to actively unethical. Here's the thing though, the Swordmaster move Real Impact technically hits three times, and it's generally that third hit that does the most damage. Normally, this wouldn't mean much. However, remember the rules of distortion. If you activate Devil Trigger when a move hits, it will hit again for free. So. If you can time turning Devil Trigger on and off at just the right times during the animation of Real Impact, you will be able to I'll put a tutorial in the description for a more thorough breakdown of how this works, as I will for all of the super advanced mechanics I'm talking about here, but suffice to say this allows you to so thoroughly melt enemies that I honestly feel a little bit dirty every time I do it. But that's just my personal favorite technique, because it allows me to feel like I'm actually good at this game. However, out of all of the subtle tech this game has to offer, perhaps none is more important than inertia. This is that thing from up top that has some people upset that it appears to not be in Devil May Cry 5. Again, hashtag DMC5 inertia. So what is inertia in Devil May Cry 4? Well, it's exactly what you assume it is, but it's a little more complicated than that. Because of course it is. On the most basic level, you can see inertia appear in anything that would cause you to drift in the air. So like, jumping backwards and using Aerial Rave? That'll cause you to drift in a different way than you would otherwise. Same thing with doing basically anything after using Nero's Charge Shot. If you've played this game, you've definitely made use of it at some point, even if unintentionally. If you've ever been doing something cool and then suddenly been like, hey wait, where am I going? 
that was probably inertia. For people who aren't super into the game, it can seem like a relatively minor element, and that's assuming it's even noticed at all. I certainly didn't notice immediately. However, while it may seem trivial on the surface, for those who commit to learning its ins and outs, it becomes the tool that makes DMC4 so unique. See, there's some moves such as Full House and Sky Star that will cause you to quickly move through the air in the direction they're performed. Good for positioning in all contexts to be sure, but here's the thing. If moves like these are jump cancelled, the inertia of that jump cancelled movement will still continue to exist, and allow you to continue moving through the air even while using another move. A perfect example of this in practice is the inertia rainstorm. The analog stick is not pressed at any point in the execution of this move. That side switch is simply a natural conclusion of the jump cancelled inertia from the full house in this engine. From here, you can control the inertia even further depending on your follow-up move choices. Things like Aerial Rave will allow you to naturally float and drift in the same direction you were already going, while most gunshots will begin to pull you back towards an enemy. And then there are moves like Yamato Rave which actually halt your inertia altogether. And that's just three possibilities of literally dozens. Now. There's no doubt in my mind that a lot of people seeing this will be like, that seems like a whole lot of effort for just some really minor aerial mobility. And yeah, you'd be right. It is a very niche ability that most players will never utilize, at least not intentionally, and many more probably won't even be aware of. Hence why I figure this is worth explaining in detail. But. If you can master using inertia in your gameplay, and learn how to properly use the moves that interact with it, then you can effectively control where you are in the air to a near exact degree at all times, so long as you've got an enemy to jump cancel off of. And this is even before we get into Royal Guard flying and the movement options that opens up, which is its own whole complicated thing that we don't really have time to go into right now, but I'll drop a link below explaining it. However, to put it succinctly, uh, it's goddamn witch. Craft. What all of this means though is that those that can utilize the inertia of their moves to the fullest extent will be granted access to a means of self-expression by way of a three-dimensional sandbox to endlessly explore that just flat out is not rivaled in this genre because no other game will give you as many possible options as often as Devil May Cry 4. Or you know, you can just spam Stinger over and over again, whatever, no judgment, your call. I keep using the term self-expression here, and I'm sure that the idea that the game where the Redcoat meme man does a demon Shakespeare is actually a canvas in and unto itself sounds hyperbolic to some of you. But I want to be really clear that my word choice is intentional. Thing is, once you learn about what's happening here, it ceases to be just some visual flurry of some rando playing really fast, and you begin to see the person behind it, alongside their own personality. Watching Donguri play versus watching Sakaki play are very different experiences once you know what you're looking at. Donguri has this exact, near-frame perfect precision to his style that's absolutely awe-inspiring, while Sakaki seems to be much more interested in manipulating the trajectory of his opponents in a way that effectively turns them into a pinball. It's like watching Michael Jordan play versus Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, or Armada's Fox versus Mango's Fox, if like me you only care about video games. It may all be the same mechanics, but each player can still make it unique to them. There is a sense of genuine personality that can be read through move choice, timing, and even just positioning. At the highest level of play, DMC4 becomes almost like an improvised hack and slash ballet. It morphs into this discordant dance as these loosely planned routines play out and are simultaneously invented in real time at a speed that seems almost absurd to comprehend, especially knowing that most of these tricks demand that they be timed to a 60th of a second. I have never been good enough at DMC4 to even approach doing this kind of stuff consistently, but let me tell you. I've had these tiny, fleeting moments where I have seen and felt what the peak of this mountain is like. And when everything is coming out exactly how you want it, as it all intuitively flows together and you just connect with the game in a really deep way while you play at a speed that you didn't think was physically possible, it's unlike anything else. It feels like riding a motorcycle while playing free jazz, while going down the side of a mountain in an 89 degree incline. There's a real ephemeral feel to it, like the slightest mistake will cause it to slip out of your hands, but by god you're still holding on and it looks and feels so good! But maybe that's just me. 
And in the face of this kind of open-ended creative potential, to spend time complaining about how shit the containment room or backtracking is, is to kind of miss the forest for the trees. Yes, it's bad. Of course it's bad. You didn't need me to tell you it sucks. And it is a downer that it's in the state that it is. But in the grand scheme of things, flaws like that are ultimately kind of trivial compared to the very unique and distinct strengths the game does have. A perfect game does not have to necessarily look like a game without flaws. Rather, perfection can be relative to what the game does. Devil May Cry 4 isn't the best linear action game ever made. It is, however, the best at what it, and it alone, does best. Or, to put this another way, if you were to ask me how come in an era where we have access to games that are newer, shinier, and just overall objectively more complete than this decade-old half-baked game, why is DMC4 still worth anyone's time? The shortest answer I can possibly give you is that DMC4 lets you do this, and no other game can say the same. Wait, what do you mean there's still more? Dude, I don't know if it's possible to overstate how much depth there is to these mechanics. I bought this game on release back in 2008 and have played it consistently in all that time. I've S-ranked the whole game on all difficulties, I've speedrun this game, and I was still learning new things about it in the process of making this video. Every time I think I know it all, there's still another quirk, another tech, another hidden mechanic that shows up and proves that I can still be better. Like, I've been talking about the mechanics alone for like seven pages now, and I'm still just beginning to scratch the surface. A lot of people are definitely going to comment things like, oh my god, how could you forget to mention this? And you know what? For once, they are right. Hell, I've barely even mentioned Nero or Virgil's unique tools, so if you've got a favorite mechanic or quirk or whatever, please describe and explain it in the comments because there is just so much to work through. And you know, that feels sort of appropriate to say here, since that's where a lot of this game's depth comes from. This game could have easily been just exactly what it appeared to be, exactly what it was intended to be by Capcom. But over the course of a decade, the scene around it never stopped testing, never stopped researching and experimenting to see what could be done. It's almost like there are two separate versions of DMC4. The one released by Capcom in 2008 that's designed to be S-ranked to completion before moving on to something else, and then this one that's used for interpretive flamenco exhibitions by people who've shotgun four Red Bulls back to back. They're very different experiences with very different intentions and goals, but it's been enough to keep the Devil May Cry community active and vocal for the entire decade between the release of 4 and 5, when no other Devil May Cry games were coming out. There was never really a moment in all that time where the scene fully lost its momentum. Or rather, lost its inertia. I made the joke so you couldn't. And all of this, all of this, comes from a game that is blatantly unfinished. But maybe that's a bigger part of it than we like to think. There seems to be a certain kind of magic that can only really come from a game being incomplete. This doesn't mean that every incomplete game will be good, very far from it. But when you rush something out the door, there is a non-zero chance that that thing will still be good, but it will force you to overlook quirks and rough edges of the engine that you would otherwise fix. Or polish. <coughs> No one in the right mind would, or I think even really could, design inertia as an intentional game mechanic as it appears in DMC4. It's too convoluted, too niche, too complex, too generally useless at low level, and DMC5 seems to be proving that to be the case. There have been a handful of these lightning in a bottle moments like this throughout gaming's history, Melee probably being the most famous of them. I compared them earlier for a reason. These are games that are all-time classics, not in spite of their flaws, but quite literally because of them. But those half-baked masterpieces can't happen anymore. Not really. Patch culture is very real, and it is hell. Add to that the fact that games of DMC scale, by necessity, have to be more accessible to a broader audience to recoup increased dev costs, and that means more polish and more QA to catch problems. I make this sound like a bad thing, but generally speaking, it's actually pretty good. Unless, you know, you want more buggy broken games. It's just that it sucks for me and people who share my taste. I don't know if games like this can really happen anymore, and designing them like this isn't really practical for people with a lot of money on the line. Not saying these mechanics shouldn't be there, just that it makes a sad kind of sense why they're not. 
This is the lesson that Smash players have been learning for years, and it seems like it may be finally coming home to roost in the DMC scene. But we still have DMC4. Deeply flawed as always, and thank God for it. There is still so much I could talk about what makes this game great. Credo is one of the best boss fights ever made. The Devilbringer and its associated grabs managed to sneak in QTs so well and so subtly that no one even noticed. You can get away hitting blitzes with melee attacks as Dante so long as you quickly guard afterwards, and that's so much fun. It makes me feel so cool while I'm doing it. Legendary Dark Knight mode is such a wild ride that's completely unique in the entire series. Pandora and Lucifer are both wholly unlike any other weapons ever put into a game. And while the writing here is definitely spotty and places, the dialogue that is there is just mwah. This video could easily be 70 minutes and 48 seconds long if I went through everything here, because in case I haven't made it clear yet, there is so much to love about this jagged mess. Devil May Cry 4 is a broken work of brilliance. It may lack the polish of its sequel or the completeness of its predecessor, but it is still very much its own unique experience. I've said this a lot over the course of this, but I'm going to say it one more time to really drive it home. There is nothing else in the world quite like DMC4. I've been playing it for years, and I'm probably going to continue to do so until my hands finally give out. It may not be your favorite game ever. Hell, it may not even be your favorite game in this franchise. I definitely rank DMC3 above it, and DMC5 is... But DMC4 is still, without question, worth your time. Play Devil May Cry 4. But more than that, practice Devil May Cry 4. If only a little. Research it just a bit, and check out the 11 years worth of combo videos. Even if you don't end up anywhere near the peak of its skill ceiling, the climb will still be worth it just for the incredibly unique experience it provides. Trust me, I know firsthand. Lightning Round Q&A. Question one, where the hell did you go? I left to work on Sekiro Shadows Die twice. No, really. I'll talk about this at great length later, but the good people over at Future Press gave me the opportunity to contribute to the official guide. It was a fantastic experience, and I cannot recommend checking out the book enough because it is really, really good. I may be a bit biased, though. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to take a look at this restaurant menu. Hmm, yes, yes, good, quite, yes, good. All right. I will take one order of clout, please. Question two. So are you back now? That's the plan. Question three. Okay, but is there going to be a DMC5 video? Nah, I was just going to ignore the latest entry in my favorite series, going to do another video on Trivia Murder Party instead. Yes, there's going to be a DMC5 video. Eventually. Sekiro 2. Question four. Anything else you want to say? Yeah, a bit actually. First off, I want to thank everyone who contributed to making this video happen. Especially Redgrave Keo, Delusionary Killer, Jesta, and Mills for giving me so much combo footage to use. This video would have been significantly worse without them. I'll be linking their channels in the down there part, but if this has given you any interest in checking out the combo scene at all, then they would be a pretty good place to start. Also, shout out to Zaki for us for that sick animation, and also to Jade for this goddamn abomination, as well as all other art here. Most of all, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please consider supporting me on Patreon to help me create more videos. Just a dollar or two a month goes a long way to making stuff like this happen. On that note, I'd also like to thank everyone who is currently supporting me on Patreon. Such as... Kevin Thurber, Black Mage App, Matthew Hurwitz, Athira, Michael Ebmeyer, Thomas Hederman, Jarison Vardasek, A Very Famous Person, Jonathan Quavito, Spiral Power, Ross Lampert, Foxcade, The Real James, Matthew Cassidy, and Sky. Thank you so much for your support and patience. I was going to read off everyone, but then I realized that not everyone consented to having their name read on a massive channel. Well, massive, you know, shut up. Relatively speaking, give me a break here. Anyways, point is, you're all great, thank you so much, and I'm sorry if you weren't included. And if you're a patron and you want to hear your name in the credits, then just hit me up. I'll happily do it. feel like I owe everyone at least one reading at this point. Again, it's been a while. Anyways, more cool stuff soon, and also going to try and do some more streams as well. Either way, though, one last huge thank you to everyone who was patient and understanding in my absence. Glad to be back. Thank you again for watching. I love you all. Peace.